this is wood sorrel. Now, some people call it uh, candy clover or sweet tart clover, but the really nice thing about it is wood sorrel. Ooh. Please notice the shape of the leaves. Do you see a little valentine heart? Okay, so no, so I'm getting smaller plants here. <laughs> All right, good. And share, if you got a big cluster, share with those. Are, okay, does everyone got a little bit? All right, hold on to it. I want you to look at your leaves. Do you see the valentine shape heart on that leaf? Yeah, that is the one, the key characteristics of wood sorrel. You're gonna have the three leaves like clover, but you're not gonna have a round leaf. It's gonna be that valentine heart. Also, there's no white spots on these as well. And what's the color of the flower? Yellow, Yellow yes. This is a really wonderful, delicious plant. Now, another sidetrack. Another thing, whenever you're on a wild edible hike with a person, make sure that the person giving the hike always eats the food before they have <laughs> before you eat it because there's so many things out there that can like make your mouth go numb or they're burning hot or they're so there so make sure the person actually eats it themselves so that way you know they're not playing any jokes on you and also a good wild edible hike person Sorry, I've been taught not to chew with my mouth full, or talk with my mouth full. Mm. We'll also be constantly checking to see if it's bitter or bad. Now, this is delicious. If you like sour flavors, go ahead and try your wood sorrel. You're going to notice kind of a lemony flavor. Some type people, it's even better than rhubarb. Gooseberries? That is very true. This tastes a lot like gooseberries. You can eat the flower. You can eat the leaves. You can eat the stems. If you're really lucky, you'll find a banana-shaped seed pod. Eat that as well. It's just an explosion of flavor in your mouth. Okay, who here likes wood sorrel so far? Give me a thumbs up if you like that. Wow, good. Who was like, eh, or no? <gasps> Guys, this is good, all right. I always like to start with wood sorrel because really, there's hardly anyone who doesn't like wood sorrel. And you are getting a nice dose of vitamin C mm, when you're eating that. And all right, so what right here, this is a nice prairie that the Jefferson County Conservation Board has been managing. They burned it this spring, which you can see, that's kind of nice. And right here, is anyone going to guess what this is going to become? Not a thistle. Yeah, in fact, that's right. I'm going to hand you a leaf. Go ahead and pass that around. Tear off a little bit of this leaf. Share it with other people. Yep, that's it. This plant is called compass plant. And by the end of the summer, it'll be, oh my, about like this tall. It'll have big yellow flowers on it. It will orient its leaves north and south and east and west. That's the name, compass plant. Now, if you got a little bit of the leaf, go ahead and crush it up and sniff it. Can you smell? Yeah, isn't that a nice smell? A lot of the pioneers would use it as a seasoning in their food. So you can't eat a whole lot of this, but you can sprinkle a little bit when you're having like prairie chicken or deer. But yep, that's some of it right there too. A nice seasoning addition. And when the plant gets really big, you can actually break the leaves and some sap will come out. And if you come back the next day, the dried sap will make a little hard, clear ball, and you can break that off and actually chew on it for chewing gum. It's pretty potent. It doesn't taste like Wrigley Spearmint. But if you're a prairie kid, then it becomes something entertaining for you to do and chew on while well, you got it. A compass plant. Yep, and that's the resin, the sap, dried sap that came from the compass plant. And does everyone know what this one is? Not lamb's ear, this is actually, say it, milkweed. milkweed. And you get called milkweed because of the white latex that's going to come out whenever you break a part of this plant. Milkweed, especially this time of year, will look a little bit by, like um, dogbane. And dogbane 
is not a safe plant to eat. Actually, here we go. Oh, thank you. All right, so here we have dogbane, for example. What do you notice about the difference of the leaves? That's right, the dogbane is very pointy. The milkweed is rounded. And that's right, the milkweed has a fuzziness to the underside, which is why one person identified it as lamb's ear. It looks a little bit like mullen, the right. common milkweed does. Whereas the dogbane, the high one up here, is very pointy and very smooth. Now, if you, the other way you can tell them apart is by nibbling on them. The, <laughs> you're not going to eat very much of the dogbane because it is so bitter and it's obnoxious to eat. Whereas the common milkweed is actually pretty good. So I like it best as a cooked vegetable. <laughs> that is good. But it is good raw too. So who would like to try a little bit of this? I actually took two of the uh, medium sized leaves and now I'm going for the little bitty guys. Mm. Now I'm going to try a bigger leaf, make sure it's okay. Oh, I got to rinse that guy. Now, you notice there's a little bit of dirt on there, so. Well. I have found that the more dirt I eat, the bigger headache I get the next day. Okay, who would like to try a little bit of that? What? So, a lot of people will sh plant milkweed for the butterflies, and I like to tell people you can plant it for the butterflies, but you can eat it yourself, too. Which makes it a little bit more of a reason to go ahead and plant it for the butterflies. You bet. Okay. Uh, yes. Is that dog pain still around someplace? Oh, I got it in my hand. I got it under my underarm. It was it was the other gentleman who. Okay. Let me. Did everyone get some milkweed yet? Okay. Hold on. This is dog pain, yes. Good job, that is correct. Look at you guys doing excellent identification. Let's see, we just had it. No, it actually does. Yep, that's dog bait. Who else needs a little milkweed? Do not eat the dog bait. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, has everyone gotten some milkweed? Because I still got some here. All right, now you guys just got to eat the tender young shoots, but there's more. Not only can you eat the tender young shoots, you can also eat the flower buds, either when they just show up as little green broccoli, or when they've got hints of purple, or even when they're fully bloomed. The more purple and the more they've bloomed, the sweeter they are. It's like eating lilacs or something. It's really cool. And then after they're done blooming, and they form the seed pod, you can eat the seed pod! You can eat the whole green seed pod! And then if the seed pod starts getting kind of big, one of the cool things you can do is harvest the seed pods when the seeds inside are still white. Okay, that's an important detail. You boil it and then you split open the seed pod and all that white silky stuff inside will act like melted mozzarella cheese. Sprinkle some salt on it, Offer it to people and they'll swear it's mozzarella cheese. You gotta include the salt though. So, but if you get that um, seed pod when the seeds have turned brown, then the white silky stuff gets too tough. So your trick is to get those little seed pods and boil them. If they're really small and tender, you eat the whole thing. If they're a little bit bigger, you can crack them open and see if you can eat mozzarella. And if you crack it open and you find brown seed pods, then you just throw it for on the compost pile. That hurt! It's like really cool, okay. So, common milkweed, it's a wonderful treat to get to eat and to plant for butterflies. So plant some around your farm or in your yard, and if you don't eat it, the butterflies will thank you for it too. Who knows the farmer's name for this plant? <laughs> it is one of the wild mustards. It's called yellow rocket by farmers because of the pretty yellow flower, but wild edibleists, wild edible people identify it by this basil leaf that's very round, I gotta lose the dog vein. <laughs> that's very rounded, there, got like that. This is known as wintercress 
because this wild mustard will grow all winter long and you can find these leaves underneath the snow. And it is a really good wild edible to eat, especially because it will be growing in January and February when you need a little bit more of vitamin C. This is doc. In fact, this is called curly doc. This is all over my farm in Louisa County. It's readily available. It's hard to find here in this county though, I'm surprised to say. Doc, curly doc is a really good green to eat this time of year. It's got a nice sour flavor to it. You can nibble on it raw. Ah, that one's starting to get a little bit better. Or you can boil it with a little bit of water and some vinegar and oil. And this is one of the things we're gonna be eating during our cooking session. Curly dock. Now, this is a little bit better, but who would like to try a little bit of it? I hope you guys get a little bit more of the sour flavor than I did. Also, as you see a flower stalk starting to go off, anyone else? You can actually harvest the flower stalk as well. Peel off the hard outer rind and eat the tender core inside. And oh. there's other docks that are smoother and don't have the curly edge. Those you can eat, but they won't taste as good as the curly dock. Samuel Thayer in his book goes into great detail about identifying the various docks. I just eat just about anything I notice with the wavy leaves. But, but there isn't a poisonous lookalike. There it. is not a poisonous no. news. Now I say that, and but then you get into um, pokeweed. Yeah. How many of you have tried eating pokeweed? Oh, you guys are smart. That's good. Okay. I don't know why people get so excited about pokeweed. Pokeweed, when it first comes out of the ground, can look a lot like this. Very smooth, very glossy. However, pokeweed has to be cooked or it will cause severe diarrhea. If you eat pokeweed a little bit raw, you can have horrible experiences. Mike Cribble of Keokuk, Iowa has a really unpleasant story to tell about that. And people down south just love pokeweed, but you have to I, know where the pokeweed grew last year so that when you see those leaves coming out of the ground and there's hardly any way to identify them, you can say, oh yeah, that's pokeweed. I know because I saw it growing there last year. Okay. And then you have to take it home and cook it really, really well. Just go with curly dock. Okay, it's not gonna hurt you at all. And you can identify it as soon as you see it growing up. And it's a noxious weed in Iowa. So every time you eat this, farmers are saying thank you. Yeah. My son loved eating this so much raw in our yard that we actually eliminated all the curly dock in our yard. Yeah, now with that in mind, the curly dock at our farm is delicious. But when I go 10 miles to the west to Columbus Junction and try to eat curly dock at a local park there, it's horrible. The curly dock at our farm is genetically different from the curly dock there and it's my farm, it's curly dock is really, really good. So if you try curly dock in your yard and it's horrible, don't give up on it. Go try it in a different place. It's like apples. You know how apples are very different from variety to variety? It's the same with curly dock and many other species too. So I love curly dock. Curly dock is a really good plant to be eating. And that's why we're gonna eat some more of it when we get back to the kitchen. We've got a nice cattail stand behind me. You can see this is all last year's growth. And we've got this year's growth coming up right here. So what I'm gonna do to harvest myself some cattails or Cosac asparagus is I'm going to reach down with both hands as low as I can on this plant and pull straight up and I get this. And I can see I've got a little bit of mud and dirt on the outside. So since I don't, you, if we don't have water for cleaning up all of it, I'm going to peel away the dirtiness like that and this outer rim as well kind of like almost um, husking corn. There, can you see how I'm peeling? And, oh yeah, all right. Onto the tender inner part, which is very tender. Mm. So you get to you eat that. that, that I'm gonna snap because I have to get down to where it gets tough. Okay, there. See how it's now kind of tough? So then I'm gonna peel again, like that. 
<laughs> okay. Would you like to try some yeah. cattails? Come down. Harvest a cattail. Show it to me before you put it in your mouth. <laughs> Are you doing okay? Yeah. Okay. You gotta talk with the tops on the cattail too. Mm. Yeah. That's a good idea. Oh. Root too or? Mm. Excellent. Yes. Good job. Yep, thank you very much. Very good. Good job. Excellent. Now, very good. Very good. Thank you. All right, now, if you're young and able, good job. Good job. Be sure to offer to share with somebody who stayed up on the hill. And it's really nice in this spot because nobody's getting muddy. I love that. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Yes. Now, as I eat this, I can't help but think it'd be a little bit butter with a little bit of salt and butter. Good. I was just thinking that. Yeah. But still. How? Good job. Yes. Oh, imagine a little bit of that compass plant added to the water with steaming this. I think that could be really good. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But how often do you get to go to a supermarket and start eating in the aisles as you're going along? And a lot of people like to refer the cattails as the supermarket in the woods. You're eating one of the easiest parts to get to. Later this summer, there will be pollen heads that will form up here. This is last year's. There will be the male pollen up here and the female flower below. If you get to these plants during the three to four days when they're shedding pollen, you can take a plastic bag, take the cattail top, put the cattail into the bag and shake and capture the pollen. And if you do that for about 30 minutes or so, you'll get about a quarter a cup of pollen. And it's this golden dust that you can add to cookies or biscuits. And it's a, like a flavor enhancer. It turns a beautiful yellow color to your food and it adds a richness and a little nuttiness to it as well. Really, really cool. Yeah, you, I mean, the tricky part is getting to these guys at the right time. Okay, that's the second easiest thing to gather. Then, you can come a couple, uh, like a week later, and harvest the female part of the flower while it's still green and still covered a little bit in a sheath. Harvest that, take it home, and steam it like you would corn on the cob. And then go ahead and eat it like corn on the cob. Personally, I think it needs a lot of butter, a lot more than you would with corn on the cob, but it's still pretty good. And then down underneath, there are like little shoot tubers that you can harvest and eat raw. They're like bamboo shoots. Or there's these rhizomes connecting one plant to another plant. They're like these fibrous, ropey things underneath. Those are the hardest things to use. But if you open up those roots, rub out the white starchy stuff, and let, there, it's a process. But you can settle out or starch that is among the fibers in those roots. And people make cattail pancakes using the fiber from those rhizomes. And that's a fairly high calorie source. And if you were living here a thousand years ago, you would actually make mats out of these leaves to make yourself a winter shelter. I mean, this is food and shelter provided for you by these cattails as well. So, ah. Oh yes, and of course, basket material as well too. So, and, and diaper material. They would use the fluffy part of the female flower when it was ready to, remember, have you seen a papoose in, a, a, the small babies were often carried in a wrap around that held them tight down here. Okay, so you would use wood moss or fluffy dry um, rotting wood or cattail fluff packed around the baby's private part so when they pooped in the peed, you could just throw that. It was like the first disposable diapers, okay? And then you could clean up the baby. Yes? Are there different varieties of cattails? Yes, there are. There's broad-leafed and narrow-leafed. There's lots of different varieties. Looking at these, this is probably a narrow-leaf variety. Were the edible aspect is the same across? Yes, they are. <laughs> All right. Any more questions on cattails? So I think we got some sumac here. I, it's harder for me to always spot it without um, the red 
berry clusters at the top. Sumac is really cool because um, when it has these red berries at the top, it's like pink lemonade growing on a bush. You can take your fingers and rub them on the red berries and lick them and you'll get this wonderful sour flavor. And if you take the berries off and suck on them, you get to enjoy them that way. Or you can dip them in water, stir, and it's got pink lemonade. Some people want sugar added. But this time of year, what we're gonna be going for are the shoots. And I'm trying to find a shoot that's as big as possible. So you can see this tender green growth here. And I'm going to actually start throwing away that and that and that. And what is this again? Sumac. This is sumac. And then I'm going to try and peel away. Remember how we were peeling on the cattails? I'm going to do that on this sumac as well, trying to get to the tender inner core. Ooh, there we go. All right, that one was a little stiff. Ooh, I got some rind. Mm. Okay, the rind is really not good. <laughs> mm. But, th thank you so much. But the tender inner part is good. Mm. Can I have you hold that for me a sec? So, I'm going to try and get another one and more carefully. And I'm going to let some of you guys try this. Or actually, I might let, who's brave? <laughs> Who would like to try and prepare? I'll let you prepare one. And you're going to find it sticky as you are peeling off the outer rind. Who else wants to try and peel? Okay. And as you're peeling, well, you're going to find, and I'll try to do this so some of you guys can. <laughs> it likes me. Yep, backing up. There we go. Okay, so as I peel, how many of you have ever like peeled bark off of a tree in the spring? That's what's going on here. So there is a layer. Oh, would you like to work on that? There's a layer that comes off fairly easily. Yes, there was. Yeah, and so what you're looking for is a translucent inner part that you can almost break with your fingers to the inner core. That's why it's easier to do this with big shoots. These are little dinky guys. I'm gonna know if it puts in my mouth because it'll be tart and not pleasant. That's not right. Okay. okay. Oh, I see. All right, here we go. Who wants to try a little bit? Okay. Little tiny precious pieces. And you guys should be going like, why would you work that hard? <laughs> Is that ready for a piece? Yep, okay, go ahead and try breaking that off. Who wants to try a little piece? Okay. And if you get a funny taste, that's because I, oh, did I see your, mm? Mm. Oh, it's kind of like, kind well, of watermelon maybe. Kind of, I don't know how you describe oh, that. there's something funny. Is the funny taste, like peppery kind of? Oh, it has an odd aftertaste, right? Aftertaste. It's the aftertaste. Well, here, the aftertaste. Well, it does have a really Is mine ready to be? Oh, yeah. Oh, good okay. one. Okay, go. got two pieces here. I break this one in half. It'd be good in tiny pieces on some of these. Because <laughs> I always associate with poison. Thank you. Oh, oh this is a different very sumac different. Okay. In the winter with the that buds. that is a good question. Now somebody just mentioned poison sumac. Poison sumac is in the same family as this guy. In fact, this guy is very closely related to poison ivy. Poison ivy, the sumacs, cashews—they're all closely related. And there is a poison sumac that even touching like this, you can develop a rash from it. This is not poison sumac. I, I one part is because I'm in this county. Poison sumac in Iowa only grows up in northeast Iowa. It likes low swampy areas, whereas our red sumac, smooth sumac, staghorn sumacs like high dry areas. If this guy was down with the cattails, I'd be like, ooh, I'd be a lot more cautious. Also, when the berries are showing up, the poison sumac will have like a cluster of berries and it kind of dangles downward like a cluster of grapes and they'll be white colored. Whereas our good sumacs are upright and have very red berries. So we had a question about wild grapes. Wild grapes, you can eat the grapes if you'd like. However, they are very, very tart. They're very, very high in a tannic. They're, they're not all that good, okay. But this time of year, you can enjoy the tendrils on the grapes and the little leaves. Ooh, nope, not that one. Pooh, that one 
was really bad. Okay, so now I go. Mm, much better. Mm, okay. Uh, yeah, and I was like, oh, okay, so finding some more tendrils. So as we go along and you see more tendrils growing on grapes, you can pick one, show it to me, and you can try it out. And let's see what these gentlemen think about their grape tendrils. Wow, you're just going to town. What are you? Okay, you're going to throw that away. Okay, don't eat that. <laughs> there you go. Okay, what do you think of the grapes? Aha! Uh -huh. Nice sour flavor on the grape tendrils. And usually, you're going to find that sour flavor on the little leaves as well. But these guys are too far gone. Oh, that was not good. All right, we've got pointed out a little plant, a little creepy crawly, that's growing along the edge of the trail here. This is called oh, no, I like, chickweed, excuse me. <laughs> chickweed is always going to be very weak stem. It has leaves on either side of it, opposite. And you'll find it growing in your garden like crazy this time of year. Now, I'm not crazy about the flavor of chickweed. That one's not too bad. But it, it tastes like um, Swiss chard to me. And if you like Swiss chard, you will like chickweed. And it is very readily available. One of the cool ways I have for identifying chickweed, can I give that to me? Is I pull on the stems gently and there's this little inner fiber that often shows up. Can you see that little fiber there? there go. Yeah. So that becomes, for me, a nice way. Ooh, I'm pulling all this inner stem. Ah, didn't even break it. Oh, there, the inner fiber came all the way out. So that's a good way to spot it. We'll be watching for more of that as we go along. All right, we're going to do a little cra cat crash course on poison ivy. How many leaves does poison ivy have? Hey. Very good. And when the leaves are small, they'll have kind of a reddish hue to it. We have a very nice example of the plant right here. That's poison ivy. And you can see the young leaves have a very red glossiness to them. Also, right here, poison ivy. Check out how glossy that leaf is. Now, some people say that when you're looking at the leaves of the poison ivy, the two outer leaves will have thumbs. They're kind of like this. And then the inner leaf will have its thumbs like that. That's not always the case. There will often be no thumbs at all. Sometimes there'll be lots of thumbs. You just kind of got to learn to look for it. This plant actually looks a little bit like poison ivy because it looks like it has three leaves, but it's not. That's not Poison ivy right there, right here, right here. Right. right. right, right mm-hmm. And so you have to be careful with the poison ivy. How many of you have heard that if you eat poison ivy, you can get immune to it? That's stupid. <laughs> that was promoted by Yule Gibbons. But I like to say Yule Gibbons started out with the poison ivy leaves that were smaller than the fingernail of my little finger. And he took three poison ivy leaves every single day. And he said he, that summer he was immune to it. However, I've known a young college woman who decided to try the same thing. She thought she was also starting with small, but she ate the three leaves. She ended up in the hospital with blisters inside her mouth and down her throat. There's lumberjacks out in Oregon who are dealing with poison oak, very similar to poison ivy. And they've tried eating poison ivy and they got the blisters not only in their mouth and their throat, but where stuff comes out as well. So. Don't try eating the poison ivy or the poison oak. If you want to try that solution, there are um, Roos tablets, R-H-U-S tablets, that have the poison ivy oil in them in very small quantities. That's what I use because I'm always accidentally touching poison ivy. I'm very sensitive to it. I'm constantly eating the Roos tablets to try and help boost my immunity to it, even though I'll still break. In fact, I just got done with a big rash of it up and down my arm. But it's not that bad as it used to get for me. So I love those Roost tablets. Yeah. I've been ordering those online. Highland, H-I-L-A-N-D, was a company that had them for sale for a while. Yeah, homeopathic if, remedy, also yep, yeah. homeopathic remedies. Roost, R-H-U-S, oil. It's homeopathic. 
Now, it's pretty easy to avoid it, and if you do brush against poison ivy, the only thing you gotta worry about is getting that oil off your skin as soon as possible. It's an invisible oil, you won't feel it, you won't know it's there till two days later when you start to break out. So if, as long as you get that oil off your skin, you're gonna be okay. Do you wanna use a soap that has lotion in it? Ah, yeah. uh -uh, you go spread that around if you do that. So a degreasing soap, something like what you use on your dishes will help get that off your, hand, off your skin. Also, rubbing alcohol will work really well. So anything that will take the oil out of your skin is good for fighting the poison ivy oil. This is a branch from gooseberry. Can you see the thorns on this? That's one of the ways you recognize it along with those leaves. Can you see the little berries forming? All right, those are tiny. They'll actually get about the size of peas to small marbles. And I call this the select a flavor bush. If you like a sour fruit, eat these gooseberries while they're green. If you like a sweet bud, a sweet fruit, leave the berries on the bush and come back when they're a dark purple. And there will be mushy sweetness. If you like it a little sweet and a little sour, find a berry that's a little bit green and a little bit purple. And that will be just perfect. It's select the flavor bush. Now, if you like them really, really sour, you can go ahead and grab one of these little berries from this branch and go ahead and try it. They're very, very tart right now. Fenstraw, also known as cleavers, because it likes to cleave to you. <laughs> and it is also a wild edible. I have never eaten cleavers because I've never been tempted to. <laughs> You would want to boil this because it, here, take a feel of it. It's very, very prickly. It's like covered with Velcro hooks. Yeah. But the flour and seeds on cleavers is supposed to be an excellent coffee substitute. They're apparently very closely related. And you're supposed to be able to use it as a rennet when you're making cheese. So if you are a vegetarian and you don't want to use calf, the lining of calves stomachs, you can use rennet made from cleavers to make the cheese curdle, make the milk curdle into cheese. All sorts, of, yeah. See, all this knowledge you guys just pull out of me by handing me plants. Violets are extremely nutritious. And what you're finding in this lawn are common violets. They will have blue, white, and even yellow flowers. They're super high in nutrition. I like to say that when you get five big violet leaves, hold yourself, here's a nice size. About that size, five of those, that will have as much vitamin C as an orange from Hy-Vee. And I say that because the oranges from Hy-Vee are not that fresh. Whereas <laughs> this, this is super fresh. And it's loaded with vitamin D and iron and E as well. Super, super nutritious. In fact, the pioneers would eat these in the early spring whenever they felt a cold coming on as a tonic. It would give them a load of vitamins. Go ahead and try your violet leaf. And what you're really gonna like is they are super bland. Oh, yes I do. If I haven't touched yours, good. Let me make sure I touch your violet leaf. Okay, good. 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 This is actually Good one job. I've been eating most of my life in my yard. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and they have beautiful flowers. We'll be seeing some too, but. The only problem with the violet is if you pick it and then let it sit around for about an hour at room temperature, it will develop a very unpleasant aftertaste when you eat it. So when you pick them, get them in the refrigerator right away. I love to add these to salads in the springtime and I always eat them raw. When I'm making smoothies for my husband, if I don't have kale or spinach, I'll add these violet leaves. The main problem with them is they're so little. <laughs> and it takes a lot of picking to pick a good cup of violet leaves, but they're well, well worth it. This is called plantain and I call it food, fun, and medicine. Okay, good, yeah. Anyone else looking? Okay, trying to get mine clean. All right. Yep. That's the All right. weed right there. <laughs> it is a weed to so many people. So the fun part, and you don't need to do this with your leaf, you can save it, is I'm going to take the biggest vein I can find on my leaf and pull it very carefully like this. And then I'm going to stretch it and I'm going to strum it like a rubber band. Mm -hmm. Did you hear it? Okay, cool. All right. Oh, 
least high up there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is what you do to kids when they're bored. Oop, I just broke my leaf. But you can pull it like a rubber band and you can play boom, 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 boom. And you can tell your kids if you're bored enough, you can learn to play Oh Susanna on this string. Boom, 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 boom. Okay? That's the fun part. Now, the medicine part is these leaves of plantain are loaded with chemical properties. They are antiseptic. And, oh, I, I can't say all the big words. They will kill germs. They will take away pain, and they will close blood vessels. They will close blood vessels because they're astringent. So if you get a scrape, a bruise, a small wasping, any kind of pain on your skin, crush these guys up and try to get some juice out. And they are hard to get any juice out of. They are not a juicy leaf. You got it really. And then put that on whatever hurts. They will reduce the swelling of bruises, stings. I don't find them to work well on mosquito bites. I don't know why. But they will work on just about anything else that is hurting you. And I have had one naturalist say, when he had a bad gash in his leg from an ax, he took a whole bunch of crushed up plantain, put it in the gash, went to the hospital two hours later, he was in a back country area, and he took the leaves out before he went into the hospital because doctors get kind of like, uh -huh. what are you doing? And the doctor poured peroxide on the cut and the doctor was like, did you clean this already? Because it's not, it's acting already rinsed. And he said, oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> he was very proud of that. Okay. And the, you can also eat these. Now, the problem is they don't taste good. I really, really don't like how they taste. Okay, these aren't too bad. But it's a lot like eating the bottom of your shoe. I mean, it's not going to hurt you, but they don't taste all that good. But the reason you would want to maybe chew them is to get the juice out. So if you had a bad abrasion and no first aid kit, then grab a whole bunch of plantain, chew it in your mouth, and then spit that out. Your mouth is now clean. And then grab more plantain, and then put that chewed up mass on your wound, and it will help heal it. Do you guys begin to get the idea that you can eat almost any flower stalk if you peel it first? Because I was actually looking for thistle for us to eat too as we were going along. Because this time of year at my farm, the thistle is coming up. And if you peel the prickly outer parts from this flowering stalk, <gasps> ooh, you find out why it's got so many prickles. Because it's very tender and juicy on the inside. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And there's a similar thing going on with the leaves. You can actually try a leaf stalk from a thistle leaf, and if you peel off all the outer prickliness, <laughs> here, I'll let you just peel and you can see if you get a piece. All right, enough with that. Oh. Ooh, good, those guys are warming up. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna work on, since you got to taste the curly dock already raw, is I am going to chop up my curly dock leaves here, nice and small. When I'm at home, I'll actually go ahead and put them in the pot long like this, because they will wilt down while they're cooking to almost nothing. And my family, they don't eat them like noodles, but they're okay with like, you know, long stringy bits of leaf going on their plate. But for you guys, you're going to actually be sharing this. So we wanna make sure we have small pieces. And you guys are going to get to be so entertained by watching me chop up some leaves. All right. And this is where I have learned to really admire those people with cooking shows who manage to talk and not cut their fingers as they are cooking along. And I've got my plates, my pots over here heating up. I always like to just use a little bit of water when I'm cooking any greens because I don't want to boil them a whole lot. Okay, so you can see this is about how much of the leaf I've got going in. And this water's getting nice and hot. I've got about half a cup to three quarters of a cup of water there. And this is my new favorite ingredient when I'm cooking curly dock. This is a raspberry vinaigrette from Aldi. It was way too oily to use on my salad. I mean, it was like when this bottle was full, this much of it was oil. Like, 
and I had to shake and shake and shake to get it to emulsify. But I found that this was really good when I used it to flavor the water for the curly dock because it's got salt and it's got oil and it's got a really nice vinegar in it. Woo! So I really, really like that. Okay. So we'll go ahead and put these guys. It could. Now you see, I'm not a big fan of dandelion. With dandelion, dandelions, and that's why we didn't talk about them. Dandelions, you have to catch them early enough in the spring before the flower opens up so they're not terribly bitter. And even in the beginning, they're still pretty darn bitter. Now, they, they're very nutritious. I will agree with you on that. But so is lamb's quarter and curly dock and violets. I mean, dandelion is not any more nutritious than violets, and violets taste a lot better, okay? So I just don't eat too many dandelions. I like dandelions for going and playing with them, with, you know, popping their heads off and things, okay? So I'm going to give fritter. Yeah, well, okay. They're talking about making dandelion fritters, and as somebody, Samuel Thayer says, any time you put a batter on something and deep fat fry it, it's going to taste pretty good. Okay, let's go in. That's good. Now, the next plant. <laughs> oh. So we didn't get far enough on our hike to get to go talk about nettles. And I'm actually, I'm not going to talk about them right yet either because my other pot's going. So the next plant we're going to talk about is one we also did not get to find in this county, though we tried, um, Teresa and I did, and that is lamb's quarter. So I'm going to show you some lamb's quarter from my farm before I cook it up here. Lamb's quarter has opposite leaves. And you'll I notice some in my that looks like catnip. <laughs> it looks like catnip in that it's got, oh, thank you. It's got whitishness on the smallest leaves and on the underside of the leaves. Oh, better not show you the purple one. But Lamb's Quarter is not near as potent flavored as you can reach out and feel it, and you're going to notice kind of a gritty feel on the underside of that Lamb's Quarter. Whoop. I'm going to keep that cooking. We're actually going to be eating these guys that we're fingering so much. Okay, feel that lamb's quarter grittiness, that powdery. Yeah. Now, how many of you recognize these as something that grows in your garden? Yeah. You are going to be so happy because now when you weed your garden, you get to eat these, which is a wonderful thing. Now, I'm going to wash these guys off. Yeah. Okay. See my high tech way of salad spinning. Okay. Now, lamb's quarter, is, you can eat it raw and taste kind of like green beans. But as Therese was saying, the best way is with eggs. Because there's something about the flavor of lamb's quarter that goes so good with eggs be it quiche, scrambled eggs, an omelet, poached eggs. Just cooking these guys with the eggs is wonderful. So I'm going to take my lovely little lamb's quarter here, and I'm going to chop that all up. And you might notice some of them have this purplishness to it. This is cultivated lamb's quarter. There are people here in Fairfield who have been growing lamb's quarter commercially in their gardens on purpose. And so this purple variety is a sign that it's the cultivated type. And very, very nice. And it's very, very tender. And I need to give my, oh yeah, it's boiling, yay. Okay, and we've got a color change going on. All right, now back to the lamb's quarter and the eggs. I'm gonna put in a little bit of oil. And I got my garlic right here. Ooh, because I like garlic. And now, oh, okay, I got ahead of myself. I'm going to chop up my lamb's quarter nice and fine. Okay, for those of you who are getting a little bit of uh, dock, do you think it needs a little sweetener? On oh, I like it. oh, you like that? Okay, cool. All right. Okay, now I've chopped up my lamb's quarter. And I'm putting that into my hot oil. 
Gonna give it a little stir, get it coated with hot oil. Then I add a little bit of soy sauce to steam it. And in a minute, you guys are gonna be getting the. Now the main problem is we usually have a lot more lamb's quarter in this dish, but both um, Teresa and I could not find enough lamb's quarter in this county and at my place. Luckily, I was starting to find it around our farm, but because it's been such a cold, wet spring, the lamb's quarter is kind of behind. All right. Yeah, everything's behind. All right, and that's cooking. Okay, cook, cook, cook. <gasps> All right, and while that's cooking, <laughs> now we're going to talk about the nettle. How many of you have heard of stinging nettle? How many of you have encountered stinging nettle? <laughs> yeah. So you might know it pretty. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so this is stinging nettle that I harvested a few days ago. And I can hold it safely like this because as soon as it starts to wilt, the stings are not erect and they will not prickle you as much. Hold on to your plate because there's more stuff coming. Okay, good. All right, so this is stinging nettle that I harvested from my house. And this time of year when stinging nettle is like this tall, you want to harvest the top mm, four to six inches. And what I generally do is I just kind of snip at it and if it breaks easily, that's tender enough to harvest. So right now, because I harvested this with scissors, I'm actually shredding it with my fingers to check on its tenderness. And I can feel that that is all nice and tender. So a friend of mine who's a vegetarian first taught me that stinging nettle was good just straight up steamed. And when you steam it, it tastes like there's already soy sauce and butter on it. It's very, very tasty. Now, it is, however, even better with a little soy sauce and butter added to it. <laughs> but the nice thing about stinging nettle is it's very high in proteins. Um, you you've <coughs> oh, you can go ahead and pass it around a second time. Oh, come on, cook a little faster. All right. S how many of you heard of the Irish potato famine? Okay, stinging nettle is one of the things that kept a lot of the Irish peasants alive because they would make a nettle tea or a nettle soup, going out and harvesting the nettle, brewing it, and then eating it and drinking that fluid, which was very high in protein and some other nutrients for them. Kept them alive. Wish it had a few more calories in it, but okay. So there's my stinging nettle, and it's going into its hot water, and I'm actually, I don't need that much. For this much nettle, I only need like two tablespoons, a quarter a cup of water, because I'm just going to steam it. And I do like to usually, once it's done steaming, I like to put a little bit of soy sauce and butter on it. But, okay, you're good, and I've got to turn up the heat here. Usually, because I'm talking as I'm cooking the eggs, I burn the eggs. But this is just slowly cooking, it's okay. So, 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 mm, <laughs> All right, do we have any questions about, oh, thank you. Do we have, yes? How did you pick the nettles? How did I pick the nettles? That is a very good question. A week ago, when I was harvesting nettles to freeze, and I knew I was going to get a whole lot, I put on leather gloves, and I was just grabbing and breaking, and then I'd put them in a colander. The hard part, then, was trying to wash them, because I don't want to touch them when they're really fresh, because you will get stung very badly. So I use tongs to rinse them. So I would use leather gloves if I'm harvesting a lot. If I'm only harvesting a small amount for like one meal, I get scissors and I, like a colander, and I will snip near the top of the nettle, and I'll use those scissors as tongs to put it into the dish. Or I'll put the basket right in, snip, like that never works out really well though. So you use scissors or you use leather gloves or as my vegetarian friend says you be assertive mm. because if you just grab it appropriately you'll actually be bending down the stingers as you grab it and i used to think well that's malarkey <laughs> but i did try it and yeah she's right but then you get accidentally brushed <laughs> by a leaf and <laughs> feels like wasps like for me like wasps mm. 
Yeah, that might be good. I have seen a video of a guy who ate a raw nettle leaf. Okay. And I was like, why well, would... So I had to learn how to do that. And, and it's basically, you pick the leaf, and then you roll it. You, you're flattening the stingers, and then you roll the le- nettle leaf up like a cigarette so that the stingers are on the inside, and then you can eat it without getting stung. But I can tell you, it doesn't taste all that good raw. Because, <laughs> of course, I tried it after that. It's much better cooked. Right. Oh, good. There we go. A lamb's quarters cooking up. We're going to just turn... I know if I turn this heat up too much, I'm going to get distracted as I'm cooking. All right. More questions on the dock? Right. Yes. Oh, oh, by the way, I have to interrupt. You notice how she did that little cough? If you're giving wild edible programs and you notice half of your audience is starting to <coughs> do little coughs, like, that's a sign that you maybe gave them something that they shouldn't have eaten. And I, okay, so this is a terrible thing to tell you now after you've been having my hike. But 20 years ago, I knew a lot less than I do in right now. And I fed people jewelweed or touch me not raw because I knew it was a wild edible that you could eat. I did not know you were supposed to cook it first. And I was giving it to sixth graders. And about five minutes after I gave it to them, (laughs) half of them would be going, (coughs) 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 and I'd be like, you know, after three years, I finally made the connection that it was a tickle in the back of their throat. They were having a slight reaction to the jewelweed. That was it for their bad reaction. But it's enough of a warning sign. Anytime you feel a tickle or a strange thing in your throat, pay attention to that. And if you're eating wild edibles and you're not, or anytime you're eating a new plant, if you feel itchiness in your throat, like it's fuzzy, that's a sign you're having an allergic reaction along with hives and blurry vision. Pay attention to stuff like that. I'm allergic to fuzzy kiwi from the grocery store. <laughs> so I've learned what allergic reactions sound like. Do leaves, flowers, everything? Of what? Jewelweed. Yes, but really you don't want to eat jewelweed. Do you cook the leaves and flowers of jewelweed? Yes, if you're going to eat it, you should, but you should not even bother eating it. Let it grow wild. Because jewelweed, I'm going to get back to your question in a moment. Jewelweed is a wonderful medicinal herb. If you get poison ivy, jewelweed will help you heal from the poison ivy. And it has a mucus inside of it that will actually coat your skin and protect you from poison ivy oil. So, and if you ever get stung by stinging nettle, The juice of the jewelweed will take away the sting. It's as quicker working than the plantain I showed you. It doesn't last as long as plantain, but it's very, very effective. So I love using jewelweed as a medicinal herb. It's like, oh yeah, there we go. It's one of those wonderful plants to get to learn out in the woods. At the same time that you're learning of the problems of poison ivy, learn of the benefits of jewelweed. Yes? So we're eating dock now in spring. As it gets big, it gets more and more bitter. This is the time of year to be eating dock in the early spring. I hope she's not having a reaction to something. Because that's the kind of cough. Okay, our lamb's quarter is just about, oh, and our nettles is done. All right. So, let that just get the church all thoroughly cooked. Ooh. All right, and, oh, yeah. <laughs> it smells good up here, too. <laughs> okay. That almost sounds like an evil laugh, you know? But <laughs> And after I told you that story about the jewelry, it's like, ooh! But that is one um, reason. You do want to make sure people uh, who are teaching you are eating the stuff themselves because there's a lot of people out there who have a lot of knowledge but not as much as they think they do. And pay attention that if they say, people say you can do this or you can eat this, if they're not saying, I eat this a lot, then you should be more cautious because I, everything I've shown you today, I eat. I try myself. Or I tell you, you know, I don't like this or some people tell me. But it, just pay attention to what they say. Okay. Okay. So it, the nice thing is there's more of this egg than there was of the curly dock. So yay! So you can take bigger samples. See, that's how I'm dividing it up. Okay, I'm going to start this plate down this way. And it's warm. There you 
back out. Oh, that does smell good. All right, and the nettle. Ooh, okay. Here. Oh, thank you. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to check on the seasoning needed for. Mm, that's not bad at all. Oh, man, I did good on that. Mm, do you want to try the nettles without any seasoning at all? Because it, uh, that leaf I just had was really good. Okay. So the nettle will be with no salt, no butter, no soy sauce. And I'm going to spread it out. Yep. yep. Do you guys need another plastic fork? No, no, we're oh, just, no, we're we're just using fingers. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, please, don't hesitate to use the plastic utensils because I'm going to just wash them anyway. And when you're done with using them, they go in this plastic tote right here. Okay. Yeah, I understand. All right, cool. Okay. Yes. Is there something you can eat with daylilies? Oh, yeah. Okay. So the nice thing with daylilies is it's like the cattails. You can eat many parts. Down underneath, there's little round tubers, like potato size, not potato size, potato shaped. They're about the size of the end of my little finger and thumb, and those you can eat. They're usually best eaten cooked like potatoes. And the sprouts, as they're first coming up, you can eat those kind of like you would cattails. The tender eater part, ender parts, peeling them like we did with the cattails. When the flower buds show up, you can actually eat the unopened flower buds, steam them. They taste a little bit like green beans. When the flower opens, you can eat the flower. You can eat it raw, you can stuff it and have it as salads. After the flower dies and withers up, you can add the withered flower to soups as a thickener. So yeah, you can eat the daylilies. Now, that is the orange common daylily I'm speaking of. The varieties that have many different uh, colors, nobody I know of has been snacking on those, so I can't tell you for sure if those would be safe to eat. But yes, you can eat many types of daylilies. Other questions? Okay, because as we finish up here, I'm going to start dishing out the ice cream. Oh my gosh. Yes! <laughs> Papa ice cream. Because as I said, we are working on a grant that is helping to promote people learning more about pawpaw for growing it and eating it. So I actually brought you guys spoons and bowls. Okay. Okay, so these are big bowls, but you're actually only getting a small scoop. I'm sorry to say. And if you like, you can stack your paper plates up here, and I will take them home and compost them. Wow. And I'll do the same with the bowl. So don't feel bad at all about using. Ooh, there we go. Good. So if you'd like, come on up and grab yourself some papa ice cream and a spoon. And Werner, are you ready to grab? Oh, and if you can. You just put that right there. Uh, tell you what, would you put it right up here? Which? Um, oh, Please. the ice cream no, you so meant. You I'm put that right there. I see no, what you no, mean. No reason to do another yeah, one. Actually, okay. I, I'll take my ice cream on my. You guys are well. so smart. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. you bet. Put it on your plate. Uh huh. Try and get another scoop of sherry. Yes. <laughs> right, so we also have a diet version of this ice cream. What version? A diet version, a low calorie version. Let me try that down. Oh, oh, actually, you guys are eating the diet version. Oh my goodness. Okay, so after you sample that, let me give you a better version as well. <laughs> Boy, that was. Yes. Okay, this is going to be really good. <laughs> oh, I can even feel the texture uh, difference in this one. <laughs> My husband tried the diet version and he was like, 
Oh, that's good. I'm like, oh. I did not think it was nearly good enough. What did you put in the diet version? The diet, okay, the rich, good version uses sweetened condensed milk. The diet version uses evaporated milk. And this is the good version. This is one of each. I want more than the fat. I'd like to try one of the other ones. Okay. Is that the good stuff, as you say? That is the good stuff. And this is the diet version. Okay. It's each, you, hey, which would you I like? I want to pass this on to somebody yeah. else because I already have mine, and Therese didn't want the one I was getting first. This, this, nobody has used this. Can I pass? What is it? Is it it's the diet? Unfilled. It's not filled. It's just got a little bit of something. Well, tell you what. Let me give the good, and then you can figure out which is which. What would you like, diet or good? The good. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. And there's a spoon right there if you need. I want to try just a little bit of the non-diet. Yeah, the good one's good. It's not good. What would you The good one. Oh, yeah. Yeah, non-diet Oh, yeah. Thank you. The texture issue. I was like, I don't. I know. It's, I don't know why it's got so much ice crystal. Oh, my ass. What's that for? Can I try one of these non-diets? Oh, yeah. Pops yes. Oh, Can yeah. There you go. Oh, I'm sorry. You had a plate. Thank there you go. It. You bet. Boy, I'm glad I realized I was handing out the non. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, you right. Yeah. The good stuff. Okay, so the pawpaw is the native, it's the largest native wild fruit to North America. And I have a picture of one. This is actually the recipe for it right here. I know, I needed to bring a bigger picture. It's about the size of a potato, and it's green. Even when it's ripe, it's green. The plant grows in the woods, and it's an understory plant, so it really loves the shade. An adult pawpaw tree will only get like 20 feet tall. And it has big drooping leaves. So it's a wonderful <laughs> yard tree, especially if you've already got a lot of trees in your yard. It will take, um, when a pawpaw tree is about, has a trunk as thick as my two fingers, then it will start to flower and to produce fruits. And depending on how good your site is and how well you control weeds around it, that might be as soon as four to five years of growing in your yard or it might be forever, <laughs> as we like to say, yeah. So pawpaws are a wonderful, wonderful plant. And what's really cool about them is nothing likes to eat the pawpaw leaves or bark because they taste like green peppers. If you crush up a leaf, it's really, really acrid smelling, very strong. And nothing except for swallowtail caterpillars like to eat on the leaves. So they have no pests in this area. And my husband likes to say, deer will nibble on a leaf and then spit it out. Because he'll find, actually, the chewed up leaf about a few feet away from the trees. So very, very cool. Who would like a little more Papa ice cream? Well, they, there's a debate about how um, extensive their range is. Because it seems Native Americans maybe spread the pawpaws out to begin with. Say again. <laughs> but generally, southern Iowa is part of the native range for the pawpaw. Thank you. You are so welcome. All right. More pawpaw, anyone? Yeah. yeah. And I meant more to actually bring good. some. <laughs> I meant to bring some pawpaw puree with me, me as well. Me a taste of the, the, the diet version. Just so I can. I know. It's just kind of a little crunchy, too. Yeah, yeah, it is. Okay, there's, well, you're going to be able to tell what's the, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. you what's bet. the difference in Evaporated yeah. milk versus sweetened condensed milk. Yeah. And that is really it for the difference. Can I have some more of the other two? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Now, when I first, I've been working on this recipe, the first few times I made the uh, good Papa ice cream recipe, I thought it was too sweet. So which is why I went to the um, evaporated milk. But I was using a variety of pawpaw for this recipe called Rigel, 
which was developed on our farm. And it's actually not as sweet as some of our other pawpaws, so it didn't work, quite work out. So if you'd like to try out this recipe yourself, it's super simple, and I have the recipe up here. You, you get to come up here for it. It's basically um, mixing pawpaw pulp with a can of sweetened condensed milk, and then whip up two cups of whipping cream until it's nice and frothy. And if you want to make sure it's nice and stable, add two tablespoons of powdered vanilla pudding mix, because apparently that helps stabilize the whipped cream. And then mix that in with the papa that had the sweetened condensed milk mixed in, and then freeze it. And that's it. Yeah! Okay, so no eggs, no butter churn, no um, ice cream churn thing needed. Oh. Usually, in the past, when my husband and I have made Papa ice cream, we just go buy vanilla ice cream, soften it a little bit, and then mix Papa puree with that, and then refreeze it. But I like this even better. How do you propagate pawpaws? And at our nursery, we sell potted pawpaws and bare rooted pawpaws. But what we, one of the fascinating things we have found is it's best to plant a pawpaw from seed. I mean, and that's why we are selling mostly seedlings now. We collect seeds from grafted pawpaw varieties or from the seedling that was this guy, which was Rigel. <laughs> Rigel turned out to be an exceptionally great seedling. So we've been collecting its fruit, harvesting the seeds, planting the seedlings, and to get more really awesome plants. In the past, we were planting a lot of grafted pawpaws. So um, Shenandoah and Shensis, which were the parents of Rigel, by the way, were grafted trees we had out in our orchard. And we noticed all these little sprouts coming up around the Shensis and the Shenandoah grafted trees. And we're like, oh darn, those little shoots coming up are coming up from the roots of the pawpaw tree or the rootstock, which is some seedling we have no idea what it is. So we had to cut off all those little seedlings, all those little rootstocks coming up. And then when we planted the Rigel, the Rigel grew and it started sending up its root stalks. And we were like, ooh, each of those little roots, that's a Rigel. It's a clone of the Rigel coming up. And we began to realize it's far better to plant the good quality seedlings because of all the root stalks, all the baby roots that, all the root sprouts that come up, which are gonna be clones of your really good seedling. Whereas when you plant a grafted tree, it's just gonna be a root sprout from whatever the root stock was, which is not often a very good tree. And the sad thing about pawpaw trees is they are short-lived. They only live like 20 years. So you get five years you've been waiting for this tree, and oh, yay, 15 years, oh, it's dead. But if you let the root sprouts live, then you will have a grove of pawpaw trees forever because it will just keep reproducing itself from the roots, yes. Each other and then just pop back up. That's why when you go to a pawpaw grove, there'll be thousands and thousands of these little pawpaw trees. But usually it's only two or three genetically different trees because it's lots and lots of clones, which is why when you go to Odessa down in my home area, you won't find any pawpaw fruits because there's thousands, 10,000 pawpaw trees out there, but we think it's all one tree. One original tree, and it just won't have sex with itself and have babies, you know. So, no fruit. Yeah, I know. I love sex and plants, you know, it's so fascinating. You need two trees because they want to have sex with somebody else to produce the fruit. Genetically different. They can't be clones. So, when all those root sprouts come up, they can't have sex with each other. Yep. Yeah, it is. Well, Actually, bees don't pollinate pawpaws. They are pollinated by carrion flies. And the flower, oh yeah, doesn't that sound weird? The flowers are these blood red, kind of gothic looking flowers. <laughs> it looks like red raw meat, but it has no smell. I honest to God, no smell, because I've gone up and sniffed these things. <laughs> you know, no smell at all. But some scientists have found that if you want a lot of pollination in your pawpaw grove, hang a dead cat. Oh. Now my husband has tweaked that and he's had hung dead raccoons in his grove. But, and because the carrion flies come for the dead meat and oh, they're like, oh, and they'll pollinate the flowers all on around. The, flower, the pawpaws are flowering right now. Oh, you can plant potted seedlings any time of year. 
in fact, here. So if you're curious about pawpaws, by the way, we have so many pawpaw groves at our farm, you can, we do you pick. So if you're interested in harvesting pawpaws in the fall, far, the fall, you can sign up to be on our you pick mailing list and we will send you an email when the pawpaws are ripe and you can schedule a time to come out and pick pawpaws. I've got that sign up sheet right here, right next to the recipe for the ice cream and we're gonna call this good people, thank you.